Gosh dang it, you dumb update. I don't care. Hey, thank you for joining the Escape With Me book club. Escape with me, Sam Reiner. And me, James Reiner. Into our most recent read. Come with us as we evade reality and go into detail about a new book. We'll be covering the book from beginning to end, so there will be spoilers. Today we're going to Fantasy City Thun? Groon with a T-H? Is that what we're going with? Yeah, it's pronounced Thun. Hopefully. <laughs> what else would it be pronounced as? I don't know, but we could go into how English is stupid. Anyway. There's not many other pronunciations of that U-N-E combination. So I'm going to take it. Published. Oh, wow. I never noticed this. Published February 22nd, 2022. Convenient. Two, 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 two. <laughs> <laughs> Legends and Lattes is the self-proclaimed high fantasy with low stakes. While readers might be used to cozy mysteries and cozy romance, what might this new world of cozy fantasy bring us? I'm for it. Why not? Sometimes you just want a vibe. So background for this, we heard about this book from literally everywhere as soon as it was published. Yes. You got it for me for a Mother's Day gift in May. And I know at that point I had been wanting it. Yes. <laughs> Good to know Tor is putting a lot of marketing into this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's worth it. I thought it was good enough where even I would suggest it to non D and D fans because it's just a comfy read as it says no stakes. That is what everyone keeps calling it. Yeah. And it's definitely fantasy. Obviously they played into the D and D characters, but the book itself is fantasy. They even have a tiefling esque character, but it's actually a succubus because I'm pretty sure tieflings are copyright. Possibly. He might have played a bit with the fantasy races to not make it so similar to D&D. Yeah. The cover of the book, she's a tiefling. I don't care what he calls her. That's a tiefling on the cover. I could see succubus with horns. It's a tiefling. Anyway, I did think it was a tiefling. And then I read the book and I was like, oh, okay. Before we get too far into it, age level, adult, not necessarily for content, but because that's the default, it's adult. Yeah, I'd say young kids. It's it's cozy. Well, it's not enough excitement. There's no really high stakes per se, other than reading it as an adult, even though it's a fantasy setting, you can completely understand the real stakes here. Holding a job, worrying about finances, worrying about your friend circle. Yeah. That's all stuff a millennial 20, 30, 40 year old would worry about, not a teenager. If it were more popular, I would label this a new adult. Yeah. That college age of I'm trying to make something on myself. I'm trying to not be who I was and trying to figure out what my new self is and going to a new city, making friends. Which is the theme of this book. I mean, that's what the main character does. <laughs> you can replace going to Thune to start a coffee shop with going to another town to start my first year of college. Yep. And it's the same feel for this book. So that is definitely the demographic. So content warning wise. All right. So this first one. I have to put this first one here because of the prologue. Yeah, the prologue is such a contrast to the rest of the book. The prologue has gore. So if you hate gore, literally just skip the prologue. You don't need it. <laughs> I've already told you before, but I'll say it for the recording. I decided to give this book as a gift to my sister who enjoys fantasy and would probably definitely, I hope, enjoy this cozy read. But I wanted to read it first. You know, I didn't want to give a book I haven't really read before. So I read it. And the moment I started this book with the prologue where she sinks a sword into a creature's head, I'm thinking, whoa, now, I don't want to give her the wrong impression. And then the rest of the book is nothing like the prologue. At all. It's still good for her. She'll well, I think she'll like it. Hopefully she liked it. <laughs> so yeah, technically there's gore, but if you don't like it, just literally skip the prologue. Once again, all that happens in the prologue is she's like, cool, I have a stone now. Peace. I'm leaving, friends. They talk about it enough in the book. You can figure out that's what happened. It's true. They get plenty of context. You could really skip the beginning. Yeah. And I don't want to say it has no literary merit because it absolutely does. It's supposed to be that jarring context contrast. So every time she's like, oh, am I going to go back to my old ways? You're like, that's what the old ways were. Uh, gives a little taste. That's true. But even then, that still has context. Yeah. I mean, you don't need the violence because she keeps referencing, do I need to use my sword? Do I need to use my violence again to express myself? Yeah. And I think it's supposed to be shocking in the beginning. Yeah. Anyway, actual content warning. 
things. Language, if you don't like language, it has a bunch of language. And then there is a subplot with sexual harassment that gets solved. Yes. So yay! Yeah, it's solved rather well without violence yet again. That's kind of what I was surprised about. I would have thought maybe she would have to resort to violence and she never does. And I kind of appreciate that. It is a true sign that she is starting a new life. She is not a hired sword anymore. Exactly. Future Sam, here to say I should have put racism here. So we were talking about the cover a little bit. Judge a book by its cover. Yes. It has a half-orc, and looking at the cover, I was like, cool, it's a half-orc and a tiefling running a coffee shop and then getting together. And ha-ha-ha, I was wrong. It's a half-orc and a succubus running a coffee shop together and then getting together. You're still wrong. She's not a half-orc. She's a full orc in his book. Is she a full orc? Yeah. Oh, she is! Yep, she's a full orc. She's a succubus. All the creatures are just kind of a little off. I mean, ones that are too broad, like elf or dwarf and gnome, are fine. But other ones can't say straight. So it's like succubus and, and hob and orc. She's just a straight orc. So I was wrong. It's an orc. And a succubus running a coffee shop and then getting together. (laughs) Which is a slow burn in the book. And to be fair, the cover's very subtle with its hint that they get together because the only sign is they do kind of have this look in their eyes, but the real telltale is her tail is just gently stroking her bicep. (laughs) Is it? Which can be overlooked, but once you hone in on it... What? You can see that it's a very subtle... She's hitting on her. Wait a second. What? Look at the cover. Look at her tail. I do not remember that. Do you have the book in front of you? No, I'm pulling it up on my phone. Okay, pull it up. It absolutely is. <laughs> I told you. Oh my gosh. You don't notice it until you do. And when you do, it's like, oh my gosh, she's practically tonguing her in front of everyone. <laughs> Oh my word. It's perfect because it's so subtle. But once you see it, you realize, oh, she is totally hitting on her. Because I thought they got together because of the look the succubus has. Because she's kind of looking at the orc and the orc is looking at the person. (laughs) It's like, these two get together. And wow, I didn't even... In my mind, her tail is still on the cover, but it's closer to her. No. (laughs) It is subtle but effective. I mean, I looked at this book, knew nothing about it, and I instantly knew these two get together. (laughs) Which is such a contrast because, like I said, it's a slow burn in the book. It's not love at first sight. When they first meet, they're just people, and the romance is built so... Slow is an an adequate word. It's built naturally, I guess you could say, at a reasonable, sometimes a little too long pace. True. Though every time it's too long, you can definitely tell that Viv, who is the orc, is purposely taking longer and being like, nope, just going to ignore that. (laughs) That didn't mean anything. (laughs) Well, I appreciated it. I like subtle romance. Not everything's first sight. I like bombastic romance, too. I mean, that's most anime romances or mangas. Japanese romances are bombastic, but sometimes the subtle's nice. So, yeah, Viv gets this stone. Yeah, it's the Skullvert stone. And supposedly it's supposed to bring her good luck. So she's like, awesome because she is an orc with a dream. Yeah, there's a mystery around the legend of it, which is a misdirect in the novel. On the surface, she thinks it's supposed to bring her wealth and fortune, just like it brought the Skalvert Queen. The Skalvert Queen is this bug that, like a dragon, collects wealth by attacking travelers. So she thinks if she buries it under her coffee shop, it's going to bring wealth to her coffee shop. And success. Success in the form of wealth, because she's terrified if the stone is ever found found or stolen, that there'll be this backlash of all that good fortune of losing all her wealth and losing her coffee shop. But we learned by the end, it's actually, it brought her people that were similar to her. The like-minded. Exactly. So it's misunderstood because if you are an ambitious person who's seeking for riches and fortune, it will help you find other people that will help you get rich. But because it's Viv and she just wants to find good people like herself, those people arrive. So even when the stone is gone, she still has those connections, which helps her win at the end. Rebuild. Yeah, yeah. Get a little ahead of ourselves. I apologize. (laughs) Well, let's talk about those friends. First off, Viv comes to town. She buys this old livery. Yeah, stables, basically, yeah. 
that is in great disrepair. Then she meets our first friend, Cal. Oh, yeah. Short for Calamity. And he is what's called a hob. What is the equivalent? It's a small spirit. So a hob is from Anglo-Scottish. Sorry, I'm looking online what a hob is. <laughs> I was starting to say, you just pulling that from your brain? <laughs> yes, I'm just that. No, I literally just put it into Google. It's like a mythological household spirit. I guess that makes sense to make him a carpenter. I gotta be honest, I always just envisioned him like a pop goblin, which is probably not even close. I was way off too, because he is described as small stature, long ears, wiry body, and leathery slash olive skin. Interesting. So I don't know why, but I imagined him as a mixture of an old man and a kappa. <laughs> a kappa, huh? Which is not right at all. It looks like he's sort of like a English looking elf. Like a mix between a gnome and an elf? I don't know. Is that where we get hobgoblins? I think so. Like, yeah, add hob to goblin. Yeah, because I'm looking at pictures in the myth from Anglo-Saxon mythology. It just shows kind of a goblinish, but sometimes gnomish or elfish looking creature. I don't care. Honestly, I just imagined him as a hobgoblin. I mean, that's close enough. Yeah, I just imagined him as an old man, basically. But he's a nice first introduction to one of Vib's first friends. He soft-spoken, doesn't say much, keeps to himself, but really good worker. She notices that, that he's good at carpentry, and he seems like a good worker. So she trusts him to help turn the stables she buys into a coffee shop. So this is the first friend she makes, because she's an orc, and she already knows people are going to be about that. And then she meets Cal, who he's working at the shipyard. And specifically, he's working by himself, doesn't look like anyone wants to talk to him, completely ignored and whatever. And he kind of mistrusts her when she first comes up and is talking about work and whatever. And so you get the idea that people are not the nicest to him. Yeah. Because he's a hob. He even tells her a nickname to call him instead of Calamity. He's like, call me Cal because it's a mouthful. Because people who don't aren't respectful enough to learn his name. Or have assumptions based off his name. Like some races, it's well known that if you have a certain name on a job application in the past and still probably today, you might get rejected just because your name sounds like it comes from a specific ethnicity. So, you know, there's this subtle hint to that, that he doesn't like to go by calamity because that is kind of odd. Don't tieflings do that in D&D &D where their name is always something poetic? Yeah, so there's two options with names. You can have a name name, but you could also have what's called a virtue name. Yes, virtue name. It sounds like a virtue name. Yeah, because, for example, things like despair. Yes. Gloom, ashes, things like that. So, and that just even more made me think he was a hobgoblin because hobgoblins in D&D, &D, aren't they red? Yes. Yeah, so, which tieflings are red, so I just thought that fit into the whole situation again because he had a virtue name. And then to call him cow, I feel like is an attempt to cover up his virtue name, which I would imagine would have complications because if you know a outcast fantasy race that has a disruptive sounding name like Calamity, you might prejudge him to be a... Calamity. Yeah, a Calamity. A misfortune, a superstitious wise, you might think he might bring misfortune to your enterprise. So definitely some uh, light tones of racism there. So she hires him and they completely redo the library. They turn it into a cafe. Every time you say library, it sounds like you're saying library. <laughs> Yep. You have to use that archaic term, huh? That's what they use. I know it's what they use, but stable is so easier to understand. So easier? So easier. Yes, listen to me. I know I know word. <laughs> they completely turn it into a cafe, which takes forever, but it's okay. They figure it out. But it really helps them trust one another and form a friendship. Where even though after this, she doesn't need Cal too much, he still drops by all the time just to see her. Yeah. And you can tell Viv is coming. Sometimes, I mean, she's coming up with projects, obviously, that she needs. She's not making up work. But at the same time, sometimes I was like, she's thinking of work so he can hang out. <laughs> 
So we also meet the neighbor, who technically she met before Cal, but comes friends with her after, Lainey. She's one of many characters where you just get drop-in visits. There's not very intense focus like the main friends that really help her at the end. Yeah. It's like drop-in characters. But I kind of love her. (laughs) Of course you would. It's, again, another old lady that reminds me of you. Well, I hope not too much like me. Not too much. Just the old vibe of I know what I'm about. Viv totally mentally doesn't say it out loud. Viv calls her out on sweeping the porch constantly so she can be about everyone's business. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And at one point, Viv was like, if I could get Lady to clean the place out, it would be sparkling. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. And then later on, they get a, we'll get to him, but they get a baker who's really good and she's not good. And so she's constantly coming over there to harass him to give her his recipes. <laughs> but she doesn't ask for the recipes. She specifically is like, let's share recipes. Like they're both getting something out of this. <laughs> I like that. We're getting ahead, though. I don't want to talk about Thimble yet. No, but I just love... And that's what she does. She comes in and she buys stuff from them, which is awesome. Because I was a little worried when she first showed up. I was like, oh, don't be mean to each other. But then they're not. It's the little old lady who's supporting your business. Yay. But she's the one who tells her about the Madrigals. Yes. Welcome to family, (laughs) Madrigal. But yeah, we get a little... Anyone familiar with any type of mafia movie or gang movie or story? Story. What character comes in? I can't even remember. It's some random muscle guy. Oh, Black. Black. That was it. But yeah, basically, she runs into the well-known family in Thune that basically pays, quote, insurance quote for businesses aka you give us money we won't burn your place to the ground yeah and so this entire time Viv is not gonna do it there's no way in the world she's paying money to these people to get them to not harass her basically so that's one of the times I thought it was gonna come to violence because this dude Lack keeps showing up being like hey at the end of the month you better pay your whatever and every time Viv is like I'm not thanks and she looks at her sword and wonders if she has to be violent. At one point, she summons her old friend, her traveling party, to come in and you think, oh no, it's gonna go down. (laughs) It is a very effective use of misleading foreshadowing, because he drops all these hints that it's gonna go the direction you think it is. She's gonna have to show her skills. She's gonna have to take out this crime family. She's gonna have to get her old friends to come and help take these people down so she can live in peace. And the author does a great job because he basically kiboshes all that. He shows that, no, she figures out a better solution, the new solution, her new way. Yeah, one of her friends knows someone that knows the Madrigal and says, hey, do you want me to set up a meeting with them? Maybe you could talk about it. (laughs) And that works. And I kind of love it. So she shows up to this area and, of course, gets blindfolded and whatever and the whole thing. Gets taken to a room where the Madrigal is and it's this old woman and I love it let's go all of the old ladies out here she just runs this mafia and they talk for a while and she seems to really like Viv and she has good vibes around good gang leader it ends up she's not as nefarious as I thought she was I mean that's common trope in mafia stories as well where they're the good mafia it felt like Lack and some of the other lackeys were playing it up and she's in the background going oh my gosh I swear to goodness you messed this up I'm going to destroy Because she's straight up. She says her rule is that she hates jerks. Yes, she doesn't use the word jerk, though. No, (laughs) but this is a PG podcast. (laughs) It is. So it was a twist. After that, she pays with pastries. Cinnamon rolls. Yeah, cinnamon rolls. That was the key. Well, I feel like we're getting ahead. Shouldn't we talk about the two other important people she meets before she meets the magic girl? I have questions about, no, I'm not going to pay you money, but I'll definitely give you goods, which have a monetary value of, I'm pretty sure, higher than if she just paid the money. I don't know. I kind of get it because it's like, um, how do I put it? She was, I don't know, doing a service. She wanted to do it that way than being extorted. I don't know. It feels like you're still getting extorted for pastries. I mean, sort of. I kind of get where Viv is coming from. She doesn't want to be extorted.
extorted by money, but giving her pastries, the labors that she's attempting to be good at, it felt more like when Calamity comes in and she gives him a free coffee or pastry. It's like a gesture of camaraderie instead of extortion. Camaraderie? Yeah, exactly. If my friend came and I gave him some food, cooked him some food, that'd feel more personal and friendship inducing than I gave them money every time I see him. I mean, it just takes the friendship out of it. It takes the relationship. It's just so dirty. I don't know. I have questions about the principal, but if it makes her feel better. If anything, the meeting helped because instead of just being this bully that was picking on her, now it's this, I don't know, established relationship where she knows the magical now and it's not a big deal if she gives her pastries to keep in good graces. I don't know. So that's the magical. She's fun. The lady in gray. She's important because she's a key part to why Viv is able to rebuild at the end. Yeah. So the next and the big one, because she's on the cover, Tandry! Tandry, yes, the succubus. Viv goes and puts up a help wanted poster after she gets everything fixed up. And Tandry shows up! Yay! Which totally reminded me of you. Tandry reminds you of me? Yeah, her personality, her I got a plan personality is I'm going to fix this because I have an idea that seems like you. Yeah, she is fun. You get her backstory in trickles because she is not a very upfront person, but I'm going to be upfront about her. She is a succubus who is very touchy about that fact. Fair. Once again, a racism. So Tandry, who is very artistic... We don't get that background. That's just who she is. Very artistic, very good at calligraphy. Two different skills. She's very good at both of them. But she grew up in a situation where people reacted to her race more than her as a person or as a humanoid. I don't know. What they did was in this world, succubuses manipulate your emotions. They make you feel good or attracted to you. And many people don't know if they're doing it to you. So a lot of people judge her uh, either fall in love with her like that super obsessed guy that knows her from the college. Yep, because she's a succubus, so she'll sleep with anyone. Anyone, yeah. So there's that sexual stereotype. But also, Viv has problems occasionally because she's worried, am I actually having feelings for her or is she making me think I have feelings for her? So even Viv has to resist the stereotype that you can't have true feelings around a succubus, so a lot of people would judge her based off that and basically put her in a box that she never liked being put in. Exactly. So she decided to go to a wizard's college is what I can best say it is. Because she thought, oh, magical people, they'll be enlightened. Yeah. Well, so that didn't work out. And then she got the stalker, which is the sexual harassment plot line, which I kind of like how it got solved. Because what ends up happening is he is one of Madrigal's lackeys. And so he's trying to be all macho tough, thinking he's a cool gangbanger, whatever. And Viv just kind of pulls up, I know your boss, and I know your boss would hate what you're doing, so do you want to lose your status here? And he's like, oh, crap. The one thing I care about more than getting laid. Well, and that's part of how what we learn about the magical, because before you think it's just this boss of a mafia organization, that they're a bully themselves, but then one once Viv meets her, she realizes that she doesn't like people who are terrible people, which would include this guy obsessed with Tandry. So it worked out where Viv could use that as leverage. Yes, is nice. And he leaves Tandry the heck alone. He shows up to collect cinnamon rolls and then he just leaves. But I think the most important part about Tandry is she helps Vib, who has no business sense. And maybe this is why she reminded me of you so much, because you have a lot of business sense. Marketing! Marketing. Tandry was good at marketing. She knew what to do to help get Vib's coffee shop off the ground. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. This is where we rip off the mask and, and I just announce how happy I am. This entire book is about the goodness of marketing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Another reason why it's not for teens. It's so boring, everyone. It's about business marketing. <laughs> Come on, we got the four Bs here. They talk about price up in here. They talk about the product up in here. The place, the place came first. Technically, the product came first and then the place and then a lot more products. I thought you said they were bees. You mean the peas? Yeah, peas. I swear I thought you said the four Bs. I was like, none of these start with B, Sam. <laughs> No. And then I was like, wait a minute. No, she said P. <laughs> P as in pineapple. Sorry, I'm ruining your P's. Continue. Product, price, placement, and promotion. So Tandry suggests for the first couple of days of doing free samples because nobody in the area knows what the heck coffee is, nor do they know if they would want it or not. And so she says, hey, let's lower the barrier to entry to get this product. I'm just going to talk in all business speak for the rest of this podcast. Why in the world did you invite me to this podcast? <laughs> Let me take my husband who hates talking about money and business stuff and talk about business stuff with him. Because <laughs> you were the one who was reading the book, okay? I know. I mean, granted, he does a good job because even I was able to follow, but still talking is like, oh yes, the business stuff. That is not the most riveting part for me. <laughs> but you're like, oh my gosh, business stuff. Let's talk the rest of the podcast. He did it so well. I'm so happy. Oh, gosh. All right. Have your fun. Go ahead. So let's lower the barrier of entry so people can try it. And then they'll figure out that they enjoy it, get them hooked, they'll come back. And so they do that for about a day and a half, two days. Something like that, yeah. Then the next day, they think, okay, let's see if we have people, if we actually make them pay. Are they here for the coffee or are they here because it's free? Thankfully for them, they are here for the coffee. And so paying customers start showing up. But another good aspect is they're always trying to think of something new. So they don't just stick to lattes. They start to do other things as well. Different versions of a latte. Eventually, they do like iced lattes, I think. Yes, they do iced lattes. But isn't there another latte? What do they do? They add something to it, don't they? Well, there's coffee, then there's a latte, which is coffee with milk. And then later, they have an iced coffee. Yes, that's it. But the biggest part is the final, or at least the big final friend, which is Thimble. Who I have questions. So Thimble is one of the people that shows up for the free samples. Yes. And they say he is covered in flour. Yes. There were three customers originally, and two of the three show up the next day, and Thimble is one of them. And he is adorable, and all of the fan art of him is adorable, just as it should be. There's fan art? Oh my gosh, let me look at this. Because he is a little mouse humanoid. Ratkin, yes. And he is adorable. And he is a baker and he bakes things. Have you not seen the Thimble fan art? It is so cute. I'm looking it up. Well, he looks like a metal tube. <laughs> Did you just type in Thimble? Yes, Thimble art. Thimble art. And there is a lot of Thimble art. <laughs> There we go. Yes, he's a little mouse guy. He's very cute. I just, oh, Thimble's my favorite. Yes, I'm seeing the one here where it shows Vib and Tandri eating his confectionaries, and he is a little mouse. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I always envisioned him as a gnome. I did not know what a ratkin was. Apparently a ratkin is a rat. <laughs> what? They, babe. I'm sorry, I don't know what a ratkin is. It is spelled literally R-A-T-T-K-I-N. I didn't know rat was literal rat. <laughs> rat kin. Usually kin has a D on it. Leave me alone. Not rat kind, rat kin, like your family in them. I know. Kin. Doesn't that have a D? Oh gosh, why am I an English major? I'm terrible at this. You need to reread this book and appreciate Thimble as a rat. I mean, I didn't think gnome. I thought like really small, not like D&D &D gnome that was three foot. I thought tiny little gnome, which is close. I guess that's about the size of a rat. No, it's a rat. It's a mouse. Well, there we go. He's so cute. And his name is Thimble. So I guess I missed the whole ratatouille situation then. We got a rat cooking the food. Yeah, you did. But here's the thing. There's a the thing that gets me with Thimble. So he keeps throwing up and whatever. And at one point, Viv is like, hey, if I hired you, would you make us food? And he agrees immediately. Brings them stuff the next day. They figure out his contract. He starts working the next 
next morning. Where the heck was he working before? Or was he just unemployed? I think he was like Calamity. Walking around covered in flour? No, I just assume it was like a Calamity situation where he worked at a place that a lot of bakers worked, but it wasn't very, didn't let him be him. He probably worked at like a large bakery factory or something. And just made the same bread roll all day. And the chance to actually... I'm giving him a whole backstory. I don't know. Maybe the second book gives him an actual backstory. Well, the second book is a prequel. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's about... In the beginning of the book, she mentions, Oh, I went to this place and I did a lot of research with books. That's what the second book's about. Really? That sucks. I wanted it to be a sequel, not a prequel. But hey, it's about books. You might enjoy it too. No, I want to know what happens to the coffee shop and the people. Not Bib's backstory that I already have plenty about. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Hey, you might like it. I mean, sure. I mean, I like this guy's writing. He seems to do well. But yeah, whenever he has another one, hopefully we're getting more about Thimble because he is my favorite. Maybe Thimble will make the cover. So Thimble is adorable and amazing and he starts working there and he's the one who apparently invents cinnamon rolls. Yes. Which there is a little snippet of conversation where Viv says, oh, two bits? And Candry, being the marketing genius that she is, says, no, Viv, four bits. Because price is part of marketing. Oh, gosh. Sorry, I'm going to go on a rant because the whole, oh, marketing's just advertisement. No, it's everything. It is business. How did I marry you? <laughs> hey, you knew. Yeah, I kind of did because I was like, I'm terrible at business. Hmm, she knows a lot about business. From the time we met, you knew I was a business major. Minus like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> where you thought I was a science major. <laughs> Which technically, yes, I did get a bachelor in science. It was better. I needed a business major in my life more than a science major. <laughs> so there's a couple of smaller characters, not smaller physically, but smaller roles. Because at the end of the book, something really cute that happens is Viv gives partnership to her major players. So her, Tandry, Cal, and Thimble. I'm assuming they form a partnership probably, but in my mind, it's a limited liability partnership because that is the superior form of business structure, but... I'm going to start going into a coma soon. <laughs> <laughs> How many more buzzwords can I fit in this before you die? <laughs> oh, gosh. If you keep this up, I'm going to start going all critical theory and analyzing this book. This is payback! How many times have you <laughs> lectured me on science fiction books? Hey, back. Hey, back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm just going to see how long I can go before you go into a coma. But some of the other characters they have is someone like Hendry, who is this big dude with rough hands and yellow hair. That's his description. He's the guy at the coffee shop that brings his guitar. It's like, okay, here's Wonderwall. Yeah. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. A little bit. It's a joke because it's a fantasy setting. Everyone assumes Bard with its loot, which is a fancy little guitar. But he basically introduces rock music. <laughs> yes. Electric loot. So we got Thimble creating cinnamon buns, Vib introducing lattes, and now Hendry introducing rock music. Yeah. And they don't like it at first, which is a little funny. And so he shows up next time with a regular loot and says, okay, I can do something more traditional. Anyway, so he starts showing up regularly and people start liking him and he starts to get a little fan club. He does. He has a girl asking for him. It's true. And I ship it already. So you find out, I think he's a stonemason family? Because he He's very vague about what he does until it's needed later. And you find out he's from stonemasons people. And so that's how he grew up and he learned to play the lute and he has aspirations to become a bard. <laughs> so cute. And, okay, Amity? Yes. It took me a second because I thought it was a cat humanoid but it's not. It's just this gigantic cat that wanders into the shop one day. I always imagined a gray version of our cat Apollo, who's a very fluffy white cat, but the size of a panther. I imagined a bobcat, but the size of a panther. Yeah, I imagined it as big enough to sit on a table as if it was a cushion, but it looked like a normal house cat that just hadn't had a bath in a long time. Yeah, so Amity's just this gigantic dire cat who's apparently a very rare species now and is also good at mousing. He's a very important character. How is that never mentioned that they didn't ever go, is he gonna eat Ratkin? They did! Was it? Oh my gosh, how did I miss the whole book that this was 
was a little rat creature. Thimble was feeling uncomfortable anytime Amity was around. Oh my gosh. And Tandry and Viv were making sure Amity wasn't going to go after Thimble, but Amity ignored him. How did I miss this this whole time? I thought it was a gnome. It is a little rat creature. You need to reread the I'm book. not rereading the book just because everything. it doesn't change everything. It changes everything. Oh my gosh. How did I miss it? It was a little rat, not a person. Oh my gosh. What is wrong with me? But it settles on because like I said, Amity ignores Thimble. But there is a moment where everyone's worried. That makes sense now, I guess. <laughs> So Amity's cool. She shows up sometimes, sometimes not. If you've ever tried to turn a stray cat into an indoor cat, it's kind of like that. Even to the point where they set up a bed for Amity and just ignores it for the longest time. And then one day just decides, hey, I live here now and gets in the bed months later. And I think the only other big enough to be mentioned is... Durious, and I would like a sequel because I would like to know more about this man. Yeah, see, that's why I'm shocked he's doing a prequel because he has all these loose ends that aren't important to the main plot of the story, but there's all these characters and people you're like, I want to know more about. So Durious is actually a gnome. You would be correct to assume this one's a gnome. Yes. He is old and has knobby hands and white eyebrows, and he plays chess with himself, but not really, but also yes. It's important implied he has some kind of time manipulation magic. He knows the future. He interacts with it. They mentioned how he's there one second and gone the next. I mean, that just has, I'm a time wizard written all over it. Yeah. And so at first, when they first introduced him, Tandry is staring at him because he's playing chess with himself, but she swears the other side moves, but she never sees him move it and she doesn't see it move by itself. And so she's very curious. And so at first I figured, okay, he either has magic or this is some sort of long distance chess game as if someone else has another matching set and they move their side and he moves his side. So that's what I thought. And then he kind of goes into it and basically says, oh, I made the moves a long time ago. And so I didn't know if he was a time traveler, like he's stuck in this time loop because later on he does funky things such as not remembering if something has happened yet and seems to allude towards Tandry and Viv getting together way before that ever starts becoming a thing. But he also foreshadows things that I feel like were foreshadowing a second book. That's why I'm shocked the next book isn't a sequel. Yeah, and I'm just curious, is this dude stuck in a Groundhog Day situation? No, I think time wizards are weird. Yeah. Because of their time hopping, they don't see things chronologically. They see things as jumbled together. So to me, it was just normal fare for a time wizard. Yeah, he's just awesome over the place. And I still have questions about the chessboard because even knowing wibbly wobby timey wimey stuff, I still have chess questions. <laughs> Something weird is going on with that chessboard that doesn't get explained, but he is playing himself technically without playing himself in the moment. It's a whole thing. That is all. That is all his character really does. <laughs> and he's friendly with Amity before anyone else is. So there's that dude. Oh, dang it. You know why I love Madrigal? Let's go back to that, because I just saw my note about Madrigal meeting her. Do you know why I love this woman? She runs a street gang, yes, but she crochets? Oh yeah, that made me think of you. <laughs> See, there's always something little about these characters, like Tandri and Madrigal, where I'm like, that's Sam. And I think that's what I thought when I first saw she was crocheting. I was like, oh my gosh, Sam's running a mafia. That's what this is. Literally, my notes are, ooh, she crochets and runs a street gang. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> I can see the cops. We found another body in the river with a crochet hook stuck in its back. It's the calling card of you know who. Okay, to be fair though, that wouldn't work with a crochet hook only because they are so rounded. Knitting needles are weapons. <laughs> That's the point, babe. Would you rather be stabbed by something sharp or something dull? The dull makes it more painful. It's like a rusty spoon. Knitting needles are literally lethal, and I appreciate every cozy mystery knitting book that uses them as a weapon. Because I just thought, oh, knitting needles, whatever, man, old ladies use them. Until I bought a pair and they stabbed through my bag. 
back. Jeez. By themselves. They are so sharp. They are scary. Anyway, yes, she is who I aspire to be in my fantasy world. Well, we're missing one character, and it's the only character that I guess you could call the villain in the story. Yeah, of all her old friends which show up, and I don't really care enough to mention them. Yeah, they're very brief in the book, too, so I don't feel like it's worth mentioning them too much. So there's this dude and her traveling companion named... Finnis? Finnis, yes. Oh dear, my dyslexic brain was telling me Phineas. Oh dear. <laughs> Phineas. Now I'm imagining Phineas from Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> he's the one that comes to the Viv shop. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, he's an old traveling companion. She's never trusted him because he always seemed it out for himself and would at any moment stab her or any of her companions in the back. And he shows up because he catches on that she has the Scalverts stone and he wants it. And he wants it because he wants it you don't really get a game plan well he's greedy yeah that's it because he was shocked she didn't want the rest of the treasure she just wanted the stone and of course that makes him curious and he starts to track her down and he just wants it he had all the rest of the gold but he's so greedy he wants to go find her to get the scalvert stone so he's just a greedy person it's literally envy because envy is wanting to take something away from someone and have it for yourself yes my dude (laughs) and that's what gets me is the not having a plan afterwards he went to such great lengths to just have it yeah and i appreciate to spoil a little bit i appreciate that it brings his own end about most likely it was a little ambiguous but most likely so i appreciate that but i can't get behind you as a villain because you just seem kind of stupid going over the top here for a stone that might do something good because your friend now has this not friend but acquaintance suddenly has a successful business my dude it's It's just the mentality of a greedy person. For real, because he shows up and he tries to weaponize the Madrigals. Which she doesn't like him. Yeah, which then she meets the Madrigals and the Madrigal warns her about him all the time. And Viv is confused at first. Why are you helping me? That's the point when she's like, I don't like jerks. And he's a jerk. But yeah, the, he's the main villain because he eventually does figure out how to steal the stone. And he does it by burning her place to the ground with magic fire. Well, that's the thing. First, she, he tries to use the Madrigals, which doesn't work. Then... He tries to sneak in. Would she set a magical alarm system to uh, to simplify? She had someone set a rune to warn her if someone broke into the house. So she stops him that time. And then the next attempt, he burns the place down. Yeah, which I don't understand. If you use the rune and the rune gets activated, which essentially it's if someone comes within five feet of this building, you're going to know. But a specific person. Yes. And after it's used, you have to do it again. You have to set the rune again. And I don't understand why she didn't set the rune again. Because even if she thought, oh, he's not going to try to break in again, I would want to know if he came within five feet of my business every single time. I don't know. That was weird. I kind of thought the same thing, but I also- so got what she was talking about. She had to ask that. It doesn't matter. Anyways, doesn't matter. He burns the place to the ground. The point is he needs to be able to set a fire without her knowing about it. So it's a magic fire. She can't stop it. So it burns the whole place to the ground. And he steals the stone thinking it's going to bring him fortune. And she's worried that now all her fortune is gone and she's doomed. Because at one point, Tandri even confirms that because she says, hey, Viv tells her about the stone. And Tandri says, well, if you do something that gives you a lot of good luck and then you remove that thing, the world is going to balance out and you're going to have a lot of bad luck all of a sudden. And so Viv now thinks with the stone gone, it's all hopeless. Granted, even if it wasn't the whole, the stone is gone, my business is burned down, she doesn't have the money to do this again. The entire building is gone. Nothing is saved except for Viv and Tandri were in the building together and there's this whole sleeping next to each other and they're so cute and whatever, but anyway, gets Tandry out, which was a whole scene. And then she gets in and she gets her strong box and the coffee machine and that is it. Everything else is ash. That's disheartening, even without the stone. So she's severely burned because she kept going in and trying to save stuff. So her physical health is not doing good. Her mental health is gone. She's just completely dissociated at this point. And her friends come around and give help fix things. 
because their friendship wasn't about the stone. The friendship was real. Because it's like you said, Darius shows up to exposition dump a little bit at the end. But hey, actually, it brings like to like. That's the good fortune of this, is that you bring like-minded individuals. And so she was someone wanting to start a, a new life and be a good, honest, hardworking person. And so that attracts other good, honest, hardworking people to her and the dire cat. So yeah. I feel like done a very thorough job of summarizing the book. So to kind of go to the end here, we are summarizing it pretty quickly because it's actually a relatively short book. So yeah, we get to the end and Tandry gives her a place to stay and she essentially organizes the effort in the beginning because she's our marketing gal and she and Cal start doing stuff to start rebuilding. And Viv says, I don't have money, essentially. I barely have anything at this point. But Cal just kind of keeps showing Showing up with materials. And so he, Viv, and Tandry start working. And every so often, their stonemaker friend, Pendry, shows up to help. And then Thimble shows up every day with pastries for lunch. I just kind of love it. Everyone shows up to do something that they can do. And it's just such a heartwarming friendship thing. Because I think it would have been a little too much if every one of her friends started rebuilding. But it was everyone doing what they could in the ways they could. Such as... As Madrigal sending Viv and Tandry clothes because theirs is totally charred right after the fire. She sends them clothes and every so often she'll send men to help build stuff and it's so cute. And so Thimble brings them food every day and it's just, it's so cute. And I will be honest though, there was a moment so right before the fire happens Thimble wants a bigger oven because that keeps becoming a thing. Is Everyone loves his pastries and he needs more and do more. And so he wants a bigger oven. But they've reached a point where the footprint of the store, the way it has been laid out, it's maximized. There's no way they could fit a bigger oven into this. And I want to say it's the next chapter that the place burns down. And my immediate thought wasn't, oh no, there's a fire. My immediate thought was, oh, that's how we get a bigger oven. I was on Thimble's side this entire time. And so Thimble gets a bigger kitchen. And to celebrate, he walks up to Viv and gives her arm a hug because he's tiny. And he's just so cute. I can't. I want a book about Thimble. Clearly. So they get a new sign, which Cal comes up with the name of the cafe. I forgot to mention this in the beginning because they're talking about, oh, what is the name going to be? Whatever, whatever. Cal comes up with the name of Legends and Lattes. And that is the name of the cafe is Legends and Lattes. And I love that for him. It makes me very happy. So they get a new sign that's even better because we mentioned her swords on the wall. It's named Black Blood. And this entire time it's on the wall, is she going to have to use it? Is she not going to have to use it? And it's a symbol of Vi being torn between her two lives. And so when they remake the sign, they use what parts of Black Blood are still existing after the fire. And they embed it into the sign. And I thought it was a really good symbolic moment of her making peace with her past in a way that she wasn't previously because she seemed to be teetering back and forth thinking that she has to completely deject her past. It's kind of a healing moment, maybe a little bit, of this is my past. I have embraced that's who I was, and this is who I am in present, and it's no longer at odds with one another. Hmm. A good point. So, not to be that marketing girl, but so Tandry puts up a new menu because obviously they need a new menu. And the new marketing slogan just gave me chills. It was something like, What couldn't be burned lives on, essentially, but much more poetic. And I don't have the book in front of me, but it was so good. And I was so happy. <laughs> My marketing soul was so happy at this point. And Pendry gets a stage, they get cool areas. Viv creates a room because she's been sleeping in a loft on the ground. Uh, she actually makes rooms. So she makes her one and she makes Viv her own bedroom and art studio. And it is so cool. And I'm just so happy. And I feel like I'm rambling on and on here, but it's just very sweet and cute and cozy. It is. So to get to the epilogue now, Phineas has the stone, which I was confused about. For some reason, I thought after the fire that the stone got destroyed. That's on me. We were supposed to realize that Phineas took the stone. He totally did 
did sneak in again. Yep. He did the exact same thing again. Oh, no. <laughs> but the Madrigals basically put a hit out on him, and Lack is trying to track him down with a bunch of other people, and so Phineas is running away, and he runs on the roof and is getting away from them. <laughs> you guys suck. And then Amity shows up. I don't know why this ending was so satisfying. I've tried to think about but basically it's implied he gets attacked by Amity. I like to think Amity swallowed him whole. I don't know. There's something really satisfying about the ending. I don't know how you felt about it. It was good. It was fine with them implying that with the stone attracting people of like kind, that Phineas attracting people just like him is just going to be his doom. I didn't necessarily need that cat eating. I don't know if I thought the cat ate him, but I did think, well, it's heavily implied the cat at least killed him. I was justified enough, though, when it was explained that the stone brings similar people to you. So if there's a bunch of Phineases, a bunch of greedy people, they're all going to end up backstabbing each other. So you're doomed, which I appreciated because I like the type of justice or punishment where the person brings it upon themselves because it seems more natural and justified. Natural consequences of your actions, yeah. Yeah, and it's tough to read those books sometimes. I've read a few books by the author Ken Follett. That tends to be how his villains, quote unquote villains, and his novels meet their end. They do some truly horrendous things in their books, but it tends to be they bring about their own doom, though, if they're super greedy or if they're super selfish or they're ruthless and getting what they want, they slowly erode their own foundation for a good life and end up just destroying themselves. So I kind of appreciate in a magical terms, Phineas does the same thing to himself because he is a backstabber and he grabs a stone that's going to attract him to other backstabbers. He's just going to screw himself over by leaning into his worst nature. So that was fine either way. It was nice, though. They at least gave us a more definitive answer. Though, actually, if I'm really thinking about it, I am a little bummed it was the cat, though. I liked it better when it was left up to the reader to envision what happens to Phineas. It didn't feel right. I felt like it kind of gypped the stone that he was just taken down by a cat. That's just me, though. I don't know. It was probably a bold choice to kind of gamble that line of, oh, do you want it to be more natural consequences or do you want something more definitive? It was more mature to leave it open to the reader's interpretation. But Phineas does deserve mature, so I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, not to say people who like that ending aren't mature. I don't know. I like my imagination more than a definitive he got eaten by a cat. So general thoughts... I like how the story is structured in a things in a day structure versus storylines. Because it, it really is. There's a chapter and there's page breaks in the chapter and the page breaks symbolize a different event that happens that day or that week or that month. And a lot of times the chapters literally are what happened in a day. And I found that very comforting and cozy. I liked it. I always do like an ensemble piece where it is about collecting different members of a group and seeing how each group member has an important part to contribute in their own unique way. That's true. You can see that in other storylines, and it works well here. Everyone pulled their weight. Yeah, it's... Except Lanny. To pull an example I'm thinking off the top of my head, why it works so well, is the famous film Seven Samurai. Part of the entertainment of it is you can see how each of the seven samurai are unique. What's their personalities like? How do they work off the other samurai personality-wise? How does each member of the seven samurai contribute to the overall goal of defeating the bandits? But that's for an action movie. This is a book that it's a cozy read. So it's not an ensemble of people with skills to do violence and an ensemble of people who all contributes to this cozy little coffee shop that's going to be built. So I like that. Whatever format it takes, I love the ensemble storyline where you have different colorful characters being joined together to achieve some greater goal. Yeah, Lord of the Rings is another good example. Works for fantasy very well. Any D&D campaign. What if Sam was the main character? Let's be honest. Of a coffee shop? You? I'm joking. If Sam was the main character, the movie would be about creating a... Oh, you mean Sam the Hobbit. I thought you meant Sam as in you. <laughs> no, no, Sam the Hobbit. I mean, I gotta be honest, Sam, you run it just like Tangri. I mean, there's really no difference in the story. <laughs> 
But yes, it's pretty great. One question for the author. So when I was researching him a little bit, I found out he started as a narrator, a voice actor, and his website has tons of books that he has narrated, over a hundred books. Oh, geez. I know. So I'm really curious, did he want to narrate his own book or did he not want to narrate his own book? Because the audiobook is done by somebody else. And I could see it going both ways. Because to take memoirs, for example, a lot of memoirs are read by the person that wrote them for a personal touch. But for example, the most recent Britney Spears memoir is not read by her because she didn't want to relive it. And I know some authors definitely are very honest about how when you write a book and you're with it all the time, constantly editing it, constantly trying to improve it, it's hard to read your own material. I guess. Well, I think the Britney Spears is Britney Spears didn't write her book. She had a ghostwriter who wrote her book. I mean, she still had to work with them. She did. She had to tell the story. No, I, not that it takes away from her reasoning why she wouldn't want to read her own book. That's still legit. She still had to tell those stories, but I doubt she wrote her book. I doubt many celebrities write their book. Not by themselves, yeah. No, they're not authors. I was about to say they're not. That is a difficult skill. I mean, if I had to write my memoirs, I don't think I would do it. <laughs> I think I'd get someone's help. <laughs> It's a tough job. But anyways, but the point still remains. Yeah, it is a little tricky when you have to read your own stuff. Yeah. And so I'm curious if that's how it was for him or if it just happened to be, oh, yeah, I totally would have loved to read my own, but it was scheduling or something or other. And so I'm curious which one it is. Did he want to narrate his own book or did he definitely not? I'd love to know. Why is your second book not a sequel? And that's not really about the book, though. Let me think of another one. That's just about you being salty. A little bit. I'm like, what the heck, man? You got a good setup to go more into these characters and you go backwards. I don't care about her old team members. They were boring. I'm interested in the new people. <laughs> well, it's not her old team members. It is specifically about the time period. She left her friends. Then she mentions, I went to this other place and I did a bunch of research from reading books. And then... Then she went to Thune. Yeah, I just still, I could care less. And maybe it'll be a good book, but it just shocks me. Why would you do that, man? You make me like these characters, and then you're just going to focus on Vib reading a bunch of books with some other people. I don't know, maybe... Oh, stop defending him. Let me trash him. Maybe he's worried he'd ruined it. Like, he'd write a second one and everyone would hate it. That's how I would feel. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you were so mad about it. I thought you'd be happy it was about books. No. I don't know why you think my love of books will make me just smooth over like, oh yeah, yeah, book. No. Plot wise, I wanted to know more about these characters you made me like throughout your first book. <laughs> oh my gosh, but babe, I'm looking at the cover for the next one. It's called Bookshops and Bone Dust. And I think she might get involved in helping to do a bookshop. Anyway, the cover has another ratkin, which I'm not terribly surprised about. Uh Oh, gosh. But in the corner, it's a little doggy with an owl head. I'm sending you this picture. It was so cute. Because she's holding something in her hand, and he wants it. It's just it's a doggy, but it's an owl. Uh, yeah. It looks like the body of a pug. In the head of an owl. And he's got doggy ears. And so that's a ratkin, huh? Yep. Gosh, I was so off with that. Not like a Keebler elf kind of looking guy. Not a rat. Oh my gosh. I no longer feel bad about Cal. All right, rating. I would give this a comfy coffee shop out of 10 because it's just something you want to go and hang out with and watch the locals. I like it. It's cozy. It does what it sets out to do. And the only thing I can compare it to is itself. I was about to say, I don't drink coffee. So the closest I could say is it is a hot chocolate out of 10 because it is sweet and warm and good on a cold winter day to just nestle up to and enjoy the warmth. Would you read it again? I would. You are required to. I have to. No, I am not reading it again because I did not realize Thimble was a stinking rat. It would change everything. I have so many other books I need to read. One day. The world will go on if I do not go back through and correct my visualization of who the characters were. So you wouldn't read it again? 
I mean, not really. I don't reread books very often. More of a one and done for you. Yeah, this is where I'm going to get silly. I have anxiety that I cannot read all the books I want to read. So if we ever get to a book where you're like, yes, I would reread this, that... That will be the day. It's going to be the momentous moment. It really would be. I don't take it as an actual, will you read it again? I take it, is it so good that you would, I don't know, just, is it really good? I mean, this one's good. I would read it again. Just, I guess I'm being too realistic right now. I just, I definitely wouldn't read it again. <laughs> Most books I read, and even if I really like them. So not today, Satan. Not today. Anything else? I don't know. I felt like I wanted to analyze it a little bit more. Okay, go ahead. But I can't think of anything. And the problem is it's a cozy read. There's not too much to analyze about it, I guess. It's kind of is what it is. I mean, if I really sat and thought about it, I'm sure I could get some kind of critical analysis of something. But honestly, it's one of those reads that why would you ruin it like that? <laughs> no, that is a totally fair thing. And you're like, well, don't you take all the fun out of the literature? I'm like, yes, yeah, sometimes I do. <laughs> sometimes being analytical of a book just kind of ruins ruins it. So it's kind of the case with this. I guess overanalyzing it is just going to ruin what it is, which is a nice cozy read. About marketing. Oh gosh. See, there's there's <laughs> ruin. <laughs> I joke. No, it, it really is a good book to explain to people what marketing is about. And how in the right hands, because marketing is a tool, I don't view it as its own entity with morality, but in the right hands, it's about getting the right people to the right product for them. It's true. And benefiting the community. It's very pro-capitalistic. There we go. Now I'm getting analytical. <laughs> now you're getting economical. If anything, though, and now I, here I am ruining it by being analytical, it's anti-capitalism because she was so focused on value being in money and wealth and a successful business that she didn't really realize her true capital, which is friendships. Friends are the true money. Yes, comrade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The value is in the proletariat. <laughs> Even though there really is no bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, not really. <laughs> Even the ones you were thinking in the beginning, oh, they're the bourgeoisie. No, they're not. They're just here to check out and eat cinnamon rolls. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no, it's a good book. It's a fun read. It should just sit on its own and not be overanalyzed. Yeah. But have you read this book? Are you mad that the next book is a prequel or is it just my husband? Do you have any book recommendations for us? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you like the video, hit like. And if you're enjoying yourself, hit subscribe for more. Thank you for exploring Legends and Lattes with us. Join us next time when we'll be covering A Blade So Black by L.L. McKinney. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm James Reiner. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time. Escape With Me Book Club is a Lunar Skulk production. Check us out on TikTok or Instagram to keep up to date with us. Lunar underscore S-K-U-L-K.